OK, let's see what you guys think. Question one. Do the unnamed dialogues at the beginning of each chapter help you understand what's going on? If yes, how? If no, why not? This was group five's question, but today we seem to be missing group five. So I have asked group three to help us out and they have kindly agreed. So group three, what do you think about this question? So group three gives us the answer that for them, um, the beginning of each chapter is already kind of surprising. Each new chapter begins in a new place with new people, especially the first three chapters where we're meeting everybody for the first time. Um, and so adding in this additional surprise dialogue that does not seem to fit with the time and setting of the story of that chapter is maybe a bit too surprising, maybe too much new information. So group three's strategy is to finish reading the chapter and then go back to reread that opening dialogue. And when they do that, they say that they do learn some new and useful information. And the most important information they learn is that these characters are not acting uh, alone or individually. There seems to be some higher plan. There seems to be a group of people monitoring them and like keeping them on track. They're being observed. They're not living their lives privately. And so that adds to our understanding of the world of the story and it also adds to the atmosphere of the book. We're not just reading a story about people, we're reading a story about people who are being closely observed for some reason. Uh, and then of course the actual things that are said in these unnamed dialogues can also add some context some additional information. Maybe the information will end up becoming more important later. Maybe it just gives us a kind of angle or perspective to approach each chapter, a kind of an introduction. Um, but it's not necessary information. So group three strategy of finishing the chapter first and then coming back to the beginning is also a good strategy. Thank you. Uh, OK, other groups, do you want to add thoughts or questions? OK, let's move on to question two. This is from group four. Uh, Ender's first thought in the novel, how, how, what can we learn about the kind of person that he is? So let me read it for you quickly. Page two, paragraph two. Um, this is after the nurse tells him that removing the monitor will not hurt. Ender nodded. It was a lie, of course, that it wouldn't hurt a bit. 
But since adults always said it when it was going to hurt, he could count on that statement as an accurate prediction of the future. Sometimes lies were more dependable than the truth. So group four, what do you make of this thought? So group four notes that in order for Ender to understand this, that when the adults say it won't hurt, it will hurt, um, he must have had similar experiences. It could be from uh, earlier medical situations, like maybe when they were inserting the monitor. It could be from other adults, because he doesn't say when doctors, right? He says when adults say it's not going to hurt. So that tells us that he is observant, right? He pays attention to what actually is going on. It also tells us that he's smart, as group four says. Like he doesn't just take each situation individually. He puts the information together. Uh, and the true sign of intelligence is not knowing more. It is being able to see patterns and rules and see how things fit together. So in that sense, Ender is quite smart. He's only six years old, but he has learned this rule of life. And finally, group four notes that Ender pays attention to useful information. In this case, it is directly impacting himself. It's very useful, very practical. And so that tells us that he is a very practical person. He's smart but he doesn't just like go read philosophy. He, he tries to improve, make sense of his life, maybe try to improve his life. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other groups, do you have things you want to add or do you want to ask questions about this one? All right, so let's move back to group three. Uh, on pages 68, Six to eight. Um, Ender deals with the bully and he deals with the bully very violently. Uh, so I was wondering about your reactions to his solution. Group three, what do you think?
So group three points out that in real life, you should probably not uh, deal with bullies so violently. There is always a better way, right? You, especially if you're just six years old, you should try to find an adult to, to help you. But in the world of the novel, Ender's solution of like fighting the kid and then kicking him when he's still on the floor until he's like barely alive. This solution is praised by Colonel Graf, who has all of the power in this uh, situation. And it seems like, uh, why does Ender feel the need to react so violently? Group three points us to page seven. Um, paragraph five, the one that begins for a moment. The end of line two. Ender, however, was trying to figure out a way to forestall vengeance, to keep them from taking him in a pack tomorrow. I have to win this now and for all time, or I'll fight it every day and it will get worse and worse. So Ender's motivation is to not have to fight in the future. But notice he says that it will happen to him every day. This feels rather pessimistic, right? Like you'll have to fight every day for the rest of your life. That only makes sense if we think about the kind of world that they live in. Ender is a special third child. He has faced social stigma. His siblings are terrible people. Well, Peter is a terrible person. Uh, whether Valentine is a terrible person, we will discover later. So like his entire life has been designed around isolation and competition and like fighting with others, figuratively and literally fighting. So it only makes sense in the world of the story that Ender would feel tired and he doesn't want to fight, doesn't want to compete anymore. Um, in chapter two, he says to Peter, and now I'm just like you. He doesn't want to fight with Peter. Um, and yet the way that he stops the fighting is by uh, an act of serious violence. And so this tells us a bit about what kind of person he is, but it also tells us a bit about the world of the story. Um, after he gets to battle school, um, he's still isolated. He still has to struggle and fight. Uh, and if we've seen the movie, then we know that the end result is the biggest fight of all, right? Between the humans and the aliens. So it seems like I'm answering question, uh, group one's question here um, that Ender's handling of his bully is evaluated according to the situation of that society. But in our society, we're not facing that kind of issue. Um, and so this is not the best way to handle bullies. The best way to handle bullies is therapy for the bully. But if you're not a therapist, you should try to find an adult who can find a therapist for the bully. OK, thank you, group three. Other groups, do you want to add something or ask questions? OK, let's move on to question four, group two. Speaking of Ender's terrible siblings, how would you guys describe Peter and Valentine? Uh, from the little that I've read, it seems like Peter is the kind of sibling that's uh, abusive, manipulative, and he tries to like instill fear into his siblings uh, through uh, there's a part where he just monologues about how he he would like uh, he would strike when when Valentine has her guard lowered and yeah that's about Peter uh, 
as for Valentine, uh, at at the uh, at the second second part, it seems like she's uh, the weak, caring sibling, I think, and she does. She tries to use her words to to uh, like alleviate the situation uh, when Peter tries to be manipulative, but it doesn't really work because Peter is not having it. I think that's about what I have. Yeah, I mean, uh, William part was pretty co uh, correct, but I would I would add that uh, Valentine would be more reasonable compared to, well, Peter, because Peter is the aggressive one. He's self-centered and he's aggressive and he's basically a psychopath because uh, the way he talks and trying to fight people was uh, in the story. He's trying to murder someone. So he's basically like a savage or something like that. He's, he's, you cannot talk uh, normal with him because you can't talk facts into him. He's uh, unreasonable um, compared to Valentine on the other hand. She's a bit uh, uh, in intellectual, more smarter than other people. She's calm and she told, uh, that's why she told Ender to uh, simmer down, to not fight, fight Peter because, you know, she's trying to stop things from happening. So I think she's a more smarter person than maybe one of the smartest in the uh, group of people. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you, group two. So basically, you guys all agree that Peter is a violent, abusive psychopath uh, who cannot be reasoned with. And on the other hand, Valentine does use reason, uh, and her motive is caring and protective, but her use of reason can also be a bit manipulative. Right, she's not saying these are the reasons why it is a bad idea to fight. She's saying if you fight, I will get you somehow. Right, I will have a record of what all you've done. You will regret it in the future. So her motives are very different from Peter's. And she's not as physically violent. But her her thinking is also in a kind of manipulative way. This could be interesting. Um, two people who have complete opposite consciences, but they think in similar ways. I wonder how that might turn out later in the book. I don't wonder. I've read the book. I know how it turns out, uh, but it's kind of interesting. Um, you guys all say Peter is a terrible person, but then how would you explain page 15? near the bottom of the page. At this point, Ender is lying in bed and Peter has come into his room in the dark and is standing by Ender. Two paragraphs from the bottom. He whispered, Ender, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know how it feels, I'm sorry. I'm your brother, I love you. How would you explain Peter saying this? I, I would say that uh, what the Peter and the Valentine, uh, Peter and Valentine, I just like the true extreme, extreme part of the of of, An, of Andrew. So so I think that maybe Peter will represent or what he exists means that maybe he's ambitious, aggressive, and brutal. But I was think that maybe we can say let's not mature enough or just childish. Maybe he's not reasoning, and just like the, the, the you said, maybe he after that when he comes down, and they will say he will say sorry to to his brother, but on the just during the process when he comes with the a battle or something he feels in danger, he try to f reflect or comfort to to have a by battle with someone. We can see from the book that too. It seems that he say he want to play the game. The Buggers and the astronauts get with the 
and and Andrew, right? So he he played the game seriously, and he even tried to he tell the Andrew that he mean it. Until the, the finally, what the, the the Valentine just save him, just save, help him the, the his brother out, right? So I think he he just want to see. He just think maybe he is because of the first the failure of the battle school. So I think he will be part of so jealous of his brother. He can stay longer than him does. So maybe the the because of the jealousy or something that he cannot control in his depth of his heart. So I was saying he's not, not mature enough or just could not resist control himself. Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. Properly express his feelings. Right, okay, yes, thank you. So it's possible that if we think about Peter not as like a character, but as a human being, he's a six-year-old kid. As you mentioned, he had already failed from the program. Uh, and he has to face his younger brother who lasted longer than he did. So it's true, he could be feeling jealous, he could be feeling uh, angry. Um, and so because his personality is more physical, more aggressive, when he has strong emotions, this could be the only way he knows how to express those emotions. So unlike Valentine who talks, uh, Peter fights, and that's his immature way of expressing his feelings toward his brother. Could be. I think the important point of talking about Peter and Valentine is to notice that this book is a book for like kids and teenagers, and the situation is very like uh, fantasy and science fiction, but the author does seem to try to make the characters uh, more than just symbols. Like Peter, here we get a scene where he, he shows the complete opposite side of himself. And later on in, I think, one or two weeks? In three weeks, sorry, in two weeks, we will also see another side of Valentine. And of course, the whole story is told through the perspective of Ender. So we'll see many sides of him as well. I think that's an important thing to talk about in children's literature. There are no uh, completely bad guys, no completely good guys. People are just human and that we have to learn to get along somehow. All right, thank you. Other groups, do you want to add things or do you have questions? Okay, let's move on to question five. We've been hinting at the importance of the design of the world of the story. Group one, uh, how do you think this world came to be? What happened to get from where we are today to where they are in the story?
So group one notes that the most important aspect of the story world is that humans are at war. And this war is so important that the adults are willing to ignore the fact that kids are human beings and instead just treat them as tools, military tools to help them win the war. Why is this war so important? Well, uh, we learn later, or maybe we learn in these three chapters, I can't quite remember, that this is not the first time that the humans and aliens have fought. The aliens have invaded twice before. So all of humanity knows that there is a hostile alien species out there and everybody is scared to death. So the adults seem to think that the only thing worth doing right now is to make sure that humans survive. Um, there is a passage in chapter three. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there's a part where Ender asks Colonel Graf, is that all humans are good for to help humanity survive? Are we all just tools for the larger purpose? And Colonel Graf says, that's only half true, but you can worry about the other half after we win the war. So the adults know that what they're doing is not normal but they have this big excuse. We have to survive, then we can talk about what's right, what's wrong. I wonder if you think that makes sense. That's something to think about as we take a short break.
So I went back to check, and the last thing I said actually comes from a later chapter. The thing about the half truth and helping humanity that comes later, but the logic is the same and it's already appearing here. OK, before next week, please finish reading up to chapter six. So finish chapter six. We're doing three chapters every week. OK, so let's go back to page one and take a closer look at this week's selection. So the first thing we see is a quotation. It's a line of dialogue. I've watched through his eyes. I've listened through his ears and I tell you he's the one. Or at least as close as we're going to get. So the very first thing we learn about this world is that. There is very intrusive. Monitoring and observation. And the reason for this is they're trying to find some kind of person or a candidate and they are only trying to find one. So already from the very first line of this book, the atmosphere is of control, competition uh, and. Um, some kind of situation. It's not a normal world. And the second line says at least as close as we're going to get. This is also very important because this line tells us that there is some kind of deadline or there is some kind of reality that will prevent these people from may prevent these people from finding the perfect candidate. So already from the very first two lines, we get a very clear sense of the story of this world. And then the other person says, that's what you said about the brother. The brother tested out impossible for other reasons, nothing to do with his ability. Same with the sister. So we know that whoever they're talking about has a brother who failed and a sister who also failed. And so we kind of understand the meaning of the, the title of this chapter, right? The title of the chapter is called third. The person they're talking about is the third person in that family. To be tested and observed. Same with the sister and there are doubts about him. He's too malleable. Too willing to submerge himself in someone else's will. So this tells us that these people who have been observing Ender for, I guess, a long time, it looks like, think that this might be his one weakness. He's too malleable. But the other person says, not if the other person is his enemy. So what do we do? Surround him with enemies all the time if we have to. So we already know that there is some kind of deadline, right? Because they say maybe he's the best we're going to get. May not be perfect, but he might be our best chance or our best option. And now we know that they're willing to create an environment where everybody that this person faces will be some kind of enemy. So maybe these two ideas are connected, some kind of deadline and a need to make someone better by making everybody else that person's enemy. I thought you said you like this kid. So from this line, we know they're talking about children. If the buggers get him, they'll make me look like his favorite uncle. So some group of. Enemy, I guess, called the buggers. Uh, I should at this point, I should point out that the word bugger is a rude insult for gay men. It's not a word you would use in daily life. It's considered offensive. 
This book was written in 1985 and revised in 1991. At the time, people were not that sensitive to language about uh, minorities and gay people. And so that's why in the movie, if you were listening, the enemies have been renamed the Formics. Uh, and when they play, for example, in the opening when Peter tortures Ender, the game that they play is called Formix and Astronauts. Uh, we're going to talk about the use of this word, this offensive word, in a few weeks. It's quite interesting. Um, it's a, as I said, it's an insult for gay men. And then the last line of this introduction. All right, we're saving the world after all. Take him. I love this line. First of all, because it's so melodramatic. We're saving the world. Of course, the person saying this is kind of being sarcastic. It's true they're saving the world, but to say it like that is a kind of joke. Uh, and then the, the second part of this quotation, take him. Uh, usually if you see someone or you hear someone say take him, it's usually like the police arresting somebody uh, or like a scientist grabbing somebody to force them to do experiments. It's never a good thing when someone says take him. So by the end of this introduction, we're already very worried about this kid. He's going to be taken. He's going to be studied. He's going to be surrounded by enemies. And it's all because that these people think he might be able to help them save the world, whatever that means. Uh, and one of them even says, like, if the enemy, if the real enemy gets him, it will be much worse. So, like, what kind of terrifying situation is this kid going to face? That's the kind of thinking and the kind of feelings that we as readers have as we begin reading this story. Compare that introduction to the opening of page two. The monitor lady smiled very nicely and tussled his hair, more in that and said, Andrew, I suppose by now you're just absolutely sick of having that horrid monitor. Well, I have good news for you. That monitor is going to come out today. We're going to take it right out and it won't hurt a bit. So we meet this person called Andrew. Um, and. Our first immediate thought is maybe this is the person that the introduction is talking about. It's a natural jump, right? The introduction talks about somebody and when the story starts, we meet a person with a name. And that's how we get introduced to our protagonist. But notice the difference in the use of language between the introduction and the opening. The introduction is all very straightforward talk, uh, some sarcastic humor, and very clinical objective language about doing terrible things to a small child. But the opening of page two, this monitor lady person is smiling, is being affectionate, and is saying things like, I suppose, which means just and saying things like, you're absolutely sick. And uh, calling the monitor horrid, which means horrible. The monitor lady is trying to gain Andrew's sympathy. She's trying to make him feel like she is a good person, that he should trust her. And also, the way that she says, I have good news. And then she repeats that she's going to take out the monitor, right? She says, it's going to come out. We're going to take it out. This is all language that uh, she's using to talk to a child. Maybe she's afraid he doesn't understand. Uh, and she wants the child to trust her. By beginning the book in this way, juxtaposing the straightforward, even cruel language of the two strangers with the false 
kindness and well, not false, performed kindness of the monitor lady. It gives us a sense that Andrew's world is fake. That he really shouldn't trust anybody because nobody is t is really being honest with him. Nobody is telling him the truth. And Andrew himself agrees. We already looked at paragraph two. This is where he says you should never trust an adult who says it won't hurt. Uh, paragraph two is also where we find his preferred name. His real name is Andrew, but he prefers to be called Ender. So paragraph two is when we finally meet the guy who we're going to follow around for the rest of the book. Let's jump to uh, three more paragraphs. So paragraph five. Here Ender is thinking about what it means for him to no longer have the monitor. And he, one thing he thinks about is, and Peter won't hate me anymore. I'll come home and show him that the monitor's gone, and he'll see that I didn't make it either. So apparently Peter is his brother, and we know from the introduction that Peter failed the program earlier. Not because of his ability. So Peter is equally smart or talented as Ender, but apparently he has a different kind of imperfection. But Ender cares about him. He cares about how Peter feels about him, right? He thinks Peter won't hate me anymore. This is very important to Ender. He'll see that I didn't make it either, that I'll just be a normal kid now like him. That won't be so bad then. He'll forgive me that I had my monitor a whole year longer than he had his. So Ender knows that Peter is angry at him. And he's hoping that this will improve their relationship. We'll be not friends, probably. No, Peter was too dangerous. Peter got so angry. This is our first hint that maybe uh, the reason Peter got kicked out of the program is because he's violent or like because he can't control his anger. Brothers, though, not enemies, not friends, but brothers able to live in the same house. He won't hate me, he'll just leave me alone. So this is Ender thinking to himself, fantasizing to himself. This is what Ender wants to happen. Next paragraph. But Ender knew, even as he thought it, that Peter wouldn't leave him alone. So we know that Ender is smart from paragraph two, but here we realize that he also is clear headed about what he thinks. So like he's clear headed about what other people actually mean, but he also very clearly understands what he himself means. This is a very rare quality to not be fooled by your own thoughts. To be able to truly see what's going on, even when you don't want it to be the case. But Ender knew, even as he thought it, that Peter wouldn't leave him alone. There was something in Peter's eyes when he was in his mad mood, and whenever Ender saw that look, that glint, Sansu, he knew that the one thing Peter would not do was leave him alone. And so here we get a brief description of Peter's behavior. Uh, the, the important thing is the last line. I can do it on my own, you little bastard, you little third. So we know Ender is the third kid, but only now do we realize that third is an insult. It's not a good thing to be a third. This also tells us something about this world. If being a third child is terrible, then most families don't have three children. So the population 
is probably not growing as fast, maybe not growing at all. Right, the normal replacement rate is what, 2.3? 人口代换率应该是每每家每每个女生二点三胎嘛，差不多。So like if the maximum number is two, then the population is not growing. Okay, next page. Uh, we get a description. The third paragraph. It's designed to be removed. Here the doctor is talking about the monitor. Uh, it's designed to be removed without infection, without damage, but there will be some tickling. And some people say they have a feeling of something missing. You'll keep looking around for something, something you were looking for, but you can't find it, and you can't remember what it was. So I'll tell you, it's the monitor you're looking for, and it isn't there. In a few days, that feeling will pass. This paragraph, I think, is fascinating because this idea that he will feel that something is missing comes back later on the next page, page four. After the section break. He got back to Miss Pumphrey's class only 15 minutes before the closing bell. He was still a little unsteady on his feet. Are you all right, Andrew? asked Miss Pumphrey. He nodded. Were you ill? He shook his head. You don't look well. I'm OK. You'd better sit down, Andrew. He started toward his seat, but stopped. Now, what was I looking for? I can't think what I was looking for. Your seat is over there, said Miss Pumphrey. He sat down, but it was something else he needed, something he had lost. I'll find it later. So the doctor told him he would have this feeling, but he still he he doesn't remember what the doctor told him. I find this fascinating because this is a hint at how the author has written this book. He gives us some information very early but only later do we understand why that information is important. Here on page three, he tells Ender, you're going to have this feeling, but only on page four does the information become important. Uh, we're going to think about this question again in four weeks after we finish the book. We're given a lot of information in the beginning that only much later will we realize is actually very important information. Let's go back to page three. Uh, they're removing the monitor. Something goes wrong. Um, the doctor was twisting something at the back of Ender's head. Suddenly a pain stabbed through him like a needle from his neck to his groin. Groin is uh, Ender has a violent react physical reaction. Next paragraph. Didi shouted the doctor, I need you. The nurse ran in, gasped. Got to relax these muscles. Uh, let's jump a few paragraphs. Not the whole thing, you'll stop his heart. So they say that the monitor is safe, designed for removal, but Ender is in danger anyway. And again, this emphasizes the idea that the government doesn't really care too much about keeping the kids healthy and happy. They think that uh, putting in the monitor is much more important than any risk to the child's life. Of course, they, they don't want the child to always die, so they try to design it to be as safe as possible. But some level of risk is acceptable for the information that they get um, from, as the stranger says, looking through his eyes, listening through his ears. So that's another bit of this story world that we can learn. After they finally get it out, the nurse asks, are you all right, Andrew? The nurse asked. 
Andrew could not remember how to speak. So like this was a serious operation that they pretended was very normal. The doctor also gets angry. The doctor was trembling. Last paragraph. His voice shook as he spoke. They leave these things in the kids for three years. What do they expect? We could have switched him off. Do you know? Do you realize that? We could have unplugged his brain for all time. So yeah, very, very dangerous thing. OK, so and Ender gets back to his classroom. He sits down and then uh, the girl behind him says, your monitor. And his classmates realize that his monitor is gone. And as soon as the news spreads, somebody starts taunting him. Washed out, Andy? Asked a boy who sat across the aisle and behind him. Couldn't think of his name. Peter. No, that was someone else. So at this point, Ender is still groggy from like the surgery. He can't remember the guy's name, but something about the guy reminds him of his brother Peter. So this tells the reader that this kid is not a good guy. This is bad news. Like notice how when I'm talking about this book, I'm talking about what's going on in the story, but I'm also talking about how the author has planned the story, how the author is giving the reader information. Uh, we were talking about the uh, opening dialogues with group three, and group three mentioned that it's too much information too fast. They don't know what to do with that information. And that's true, but it's also true for every story that you read. When, if you go pick up a story, very few stories start with once upon a time, there was a girl in the woods going to her grandmother's house. Most stories start in the middle of something and you have to figure out what's going on. And if you think about it, and that happens in life too, right? Uh, let's say you're late for class. You walk into the classroom. The class has already started. You have to figure out what's going on. In the future, when you go to work, when you go to a new job, Everybody already has their own jobs and you have to figure out what's going on. And so that's another way that reading fiction can uh, help you grow as a person and also help train your mind. You always have to be looking for clues. Uh, to figure out what is going on. Uh, let's continue. Quiet, Mr. Stilson said Ms. Pumphrey. So the kid's name is Stilson. OK. Then we have a description of their desk, which is actually a tablet computer. Again, this book was written in 1990. Well, it was written in 1985. At that time, even the Internet was not in widespread use, let alone tablet computers. So that's a science fictional part of this story. Uh, and w on page five, he looks at his desk and somebody has sent him an insult and called him a third. Ender smiled. He was the one who had figured out how to send messages and make them march around the desk. Even as his secret enemy called him names, the method of delivery praised him. So that's an interesting way to think about it. When somebody insults him, he doesn't get angry. He feels satisfied because even somebody insulting him has to use the way that he invented. So we see here that he doesn't care too much about things like uh, pride or like appearances, you know, being insulted. He cares more about getting things done. As group four mentioned, he seems to be a very practical kid. So this is his achievement. He managed, he taught other people how to get this thing done, and that's what Ender really cares about. It was not his fault he was a third. It was the government's idea. They were the ones who authorized it. 
So this tells us that all of these rules in this society we have been noticing are not a evol social evolution, right? It didn't come about like this naturally. It was the government setting these rules. And so just like the two strangers at the beginning of the chapter seem to represent some kind of authority. Uh, here we see that the government does have great authority, a lot of power. The government can order people not to have a third child and order some people to actually do have a third child. Uh, OK, and then we get some plot. Uh, the class ends, people leave. Ender is thinking his own thoughts. And then on page six. Uh, Ender leaves or he tries to leave. But he gets blocked by Stilson. So let's start there. It was Stilson, of course. He wasn't bigger than most other kids, but he was bigger than Ender. And he had some others with him. He always did. Uh, so as classic bullies will do, they taunt him. Uh, and then from taunting, they start moving to like physical uh, harassment. So at the bottom of the page, this would not have a happy ending. So again, notice Stilson and his gang have not yet turned violent. They're simply pushing him around, playing with him. Well, not playing with him, toying with him. But Ender says he knows that this would not have a happy ending. He has seen this pattern before. He knows that taunting and physically harassing turns into torture and violence. And so he decided that he'd rather not be the unhappiest at the end. The next time Stilson's arm came out to push him, Ender grabbed at it. He missed. This is very scary. There's a saying in English. When you aim for the king, you'd better not miss. Uh, so now they know Ender wants to fight them. And they have the excuse that they're not the 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 gang. Stilson is not the person who started the fight. Uh, so now that the fight has actually begun, people hold Ender back. Uh, and then Ender uses some psychology to get them to let him go. He says on page seven. Uh, near the top. Ender did not feel like laughing, but he laughed. You mean it takes this many of you to fight one third? We're people, not thirds, turd face. You're about as strong as a fart. But they let go of him. That's the part Ender cares about. He doesn't care about being insulted. He cares about um, achieving his goal. But they let go of him. And as soon as they did, Ender kicked out high and hard catching Stilson square in the breastbone, which is the chest. Uh, he dropped, so Stilson fell to the ground. It took Ender by surprise. He hadn't thought to put Stilson on the ground with one kick. It didn't occur to him that Stilson didn't take a fight like this seriously, that he wasn't prepared for a truly desperate blow. So I think this is the first time we see a weakness from Ender. Ender did not understand that from Stilson's perspective, it was not a serious fight. So that tells us even someone as smart and observant as Ender is also locked into his own perspective. That as group four mentioned, he learns quickly, but he has to learn from experience. His imagination is not perfect. For a moment, oh, also I should tell you, if you ever do get into a fight and you do have to fight, the best time to hit the other person is when the other person is talking. They don't expect it. 
but try not to fight. It's not a good thing. For a moment, the others backed away and Stilson lay motionless. So at this point, Ender is surprised. Stilson's friends are surprised. Everybody is surprised. But it is at this moment that Ender decides he has to end this fight in the future also. And so uh, next paragraph, Ender knew the unspoken rules of manly warfare, even though he was only six. This is also a very clever sentence. The important part of this sentence is Ender's age. Up to this point, we don't know what grade he's in. We don't know how old he is. He's six. And the surprise of that information, because like he's being treated very violently. The government cares a lot about him. They're going to torture him. He's getting into this deadly fight with somebody. We think he's much older, but in fact, he's only six. The surprise of that information distracts us from the first half of the sentence. Ender is six. How does he know about the rules of fighting? Doesn't make sense, but we don't notice that because we're still shocked by his age. Uh, he knows that you're not supposed to hit someone on the ground, so that's exactly what he does. So Ender doesn't give us the reason why uh, he does something that people think you should not do, but it actually makes a lot of sense. The most surprising thing you can do is to break the rules. Because nobody thinks about breaking the rules. So if his goal is to win this fight, this is the best thing he could have done. To do exactly what people tell you you shouldn't do. I actually have a short story about this. So like in high school math, uh, one of the one of our tests was about uh, algorithmic formulas. Something like that. Um, and it, the, it had to do with angles. So it was probably like trigonometry or something. And on the test, it said, uh, when answering these questions, do not use special angles like zero degrees, 180 degrees. You have to actually do the problems. Um, but after the exam ended and our math teacher was going over the exam with us, the way that he solved the problems is exactly by putting in zero degrees and seeing what the answer was. Uh, and we were all shocked, right? The problem said you can't do that. And our math teacher said, why not? The logic is the same. Are you going to follow the rules just because someone tells you? So. The most surprising thing you can do is to break the rules. On the other hand, most rules are rules for a reason. Uh, so if you do break the rules, you have to think very carefully about what's going to happen next. As a teacher, I should tell you don't break the rules. OK. Uh, so that's what Ender does. He goes over and he kicks Stilson's supine body. Supine means lying on his back. And he kicked him again viciously in the ribs. Leku. Stilson groaned and rolled away from him. Ender walked around him and kicked him again in the crotch. Shushibu. So Ender doesn't kick him once. He doesn't kick him twice. He kicks him three times. He walks around to get a better angle to kick him. Ender is a very serious kid. As we said, he cares about achieving his goals. And then this is what he says to Stilson's friends. Last paragraph. You might be having some idea of ganging up on me. You could probably beat me up pretty bad. But just remember what I do to people who try to hurt me. From then on, you'd be wondering when I'd get you and how bad it would be. I want to jump ahead for a second. Let's jump to Page 12. Page 13.
So this is when Peter is torturing Ender. And Valentine says, don't, you'll kill him. Peter said, uh, they won't believe me, that they won't believe that I killed him. I can just tell them it was an accident. On top of page 13. Uh, sorry, where was it? Uh, sorry, on page 12. Near uh, the second half of the page, the, the paragraph that begins, I could kill you like this. I could kill you like this, Peter whispered. Just press and press until you're dead. And I could say that I didn't know it would hurt you, that we were just playing and they'd believe me and everything would be fine and you'd be dead. Then on page 13, uh, Valentine tries to threaten him also. Uh, so the big paragraph in the first half of the page. And do you know why you don't mean it? Valentine asked. Because you want to be in government someday. You want to be elected. And they won't elect you if your opponents can dig up the fact that your brother and sister both died in suspicious accidents when they were little. Especially because of the letter I've put in my secret file in the city library, which will be opened in the event of my death. And then Peter says, uh, you're going to have to protect him for the rest of your life. And she says uh, she will and she'll never let down her guard in front of Peter. And in the last paragraph, Peter says, oh, I know. But there will come a day when you aren't there with him, when you forget. And suddenly you'll remember and you'll rush to him and there he'll be perfectly all right. And the next time you won't worry so much and you won't come so fast and every time he'll be all right. And you'll think that I forgot. Even though you'll remember that I said this, you'll think that I forgot. And years will pass. And then there will be a terrible accident. And I'll find his body and I'll cry and cry over him. And you'll remember this conversation, Valley. But you'll be ashamed of yourself for remembering. Because you'll know that I changed. That it really was an accident. That it's cruel of you even to remember what I said in a childhood quarrel except that it'll be true. I'm going to save this up and he's going to die and you won't do a thing, not a thing. So Peter uses the future. Let's start from the beginning. Ender uses the future to threaten Stilson's friends. Valentine uses the future to threaten Peter and Peter uses the future to threaten Valentine. These three really are siblings. They're more alike than we would like to think. Right, it's that idea of manipulation. OK, let's go back to page seven, the very bottom of the page. Uh, Ender is saying like, uh, you'll wonder when I'll get you. After he finished talk, uh, finishes talking, he kicked Stilson in the face. He kicks the guy a fourth time. This is like really, really violent. Next page. It wouldn't be this bad, Ender said. It would be worse. And Ender says, or he thinks to himself that he did this in order to survive in order to end future fights. But at the end of this chapter, he does feel remorse. He knows this is not a normal thing to do. Three lines from the bottom. Ender leaned his head against the wall of the corridor, corridor means hallway, and cried until the bus came. I am just like Peter. Take my monitor away and I am just like Peter. So that is our introduction to Ender. He's put in a violent situation. He reacts violently and he does uh, achieve his goals, but he hates himself for doing it that way. That is the picture of the six year old boy that we get when we start reading this novel. So 
So, like, remember how I approached the beginning of chapter one with the two strangers having dialogue? That's one way that you can approach the beginning of every chapter. What are they talking about? Is there new information? What are the higher powers thinking of doing to Ender? And in that way, it can give us a kind of clue as to what might happen in that chapter. So for example, on page nine, these two people are talking about Ender's fight. Um, and in the middle, it says, spare me. So in the judgment of the committee, he passes. So again, Ender, extremely violent, hates himself, but these two strangers say that he did the right thing or he did the good thing. We get a sense that we should be afraid of these two people for Ender's sake. And indeed, on page 10, the last paragraph of the introduction, we're the wicked witch. This is from the Wizard of Oz, Duryea Xianzong. There's a good witch and a bad witch. We're the wicked witch. We promise gingerbread, but we eat the little bastards alive. Do you guys know the fairy tale Hansel and Gretel? Uh, the one where two kids, two a uh, brother and a sister, Hansel and Gretel, get lost in the woods. They find like candy on the ground, right? They follow the candy. They get to a house made out of gingerbread, which is a sweet kind of bread. Uh, and apparently it's built by a wicked witch who wants to eat the children. So that's what they're talking about here. We're uh, we're the wicked witch. We promise gingerbread, but we eat the little bastards alive. So we say we're going to do a good thing, but in fact, what we're actually doing is mistreating these children. And then on page 10, the first line of the chapter, is, I'm sorry, Ender, Valentine whispered. This is the first time in the book that somebody expresses genuine emotion. The nurse is lying to Ender. The doctor expresses fear about hurting Ender, but he doesn't say that to Ender. He's afraid for himself. The other kids gossip about Ender. The teacher just wants Ender to sit down. Stilson wants to, to fight Ender. This is the first time in the story that somebody actually cares about how Ender feels as a human being. I'm sorry, Ender, Valentine whispered. And this is our introduction to Valentine. The book seems to be telling us the most important thing to know about Valentine is that she really cares about Ender. And if you remember at the be beginning of chapter one, the two strangers said that they will turn everybody into enemies for Ender. We get a sense that Valentine could be a very important character in his life. We also know that the two uh, people talked about a brother and a sister. So Valentine is probably his sister. Uh, but right as soon as she says, I'm sorry, Peter walks in. And I, I love his entrance. Peter walked into the parlor. The parlor is like a living room, cutting, chewing on a mouthful of bread and peanut butter. I love this. So like, um, the idea of walking and eating at the same time expresses a kind of carefree attitude, a sense of freedom. Um, like you don't have to eat while sitting at the table. You can take your food with you. You can control how you eat. Uh, and here he's eating and talking at the same time. So our first uh, encounter with Peter is he's in control of his food. He's in control of his situation. He doesn't, uh, he's not afraid of other people. And the first thing he says is he wants to find out what's going on. This gives us a sense of like, a, we know that he's a dangerous person. He gets angry easily. He failed the program because of his anger. 
and now he's eating and walking and he appears in the scene like nothing's going on. This is actually a very scary entrance. Another way to think about this is Ender and Valentine are sharing a very emotionally vulnerable moment. Ender's feeling bad. Valentine's trying to comfort him. And then in walks this dude who gets mad easily, is violent. Everybody hates him. And he doesn't care. He's just walking and eating, like minding his own business. And he hears something's going on and he, he wants to find out what's going on. He wants to try to insert himself into the situation, try to get some kind of control. Does that make sense? So this is also a very genius en entrance for Peter. From this scene, we already get a clear sense of what kind of person he is. Everybody is afraid of him. Everybody hates him. He doesn't care. Ender did not see Peter as the beautiful 10-year-old boy that grown-ups saw with dark, thick, tousled hair and a face that could have belonged to Alexander the Great. Okay, they compare Peter to Alexander the Great. Of all the handsome people you could compare him to, they compared him to the person who conquered Europe and the Middle East and Northern Africa. This connection immediately makes us think that Peter is very ambitious. And of course, we learn later that Valentine says he wants to be in government. So it's true, he does have ambition. And this is part of our introduction to him. When you compare him to somebody, you compare him to a powerful leader like Alexander the Great. This also tells us that the kids know Peter is a monster, and the, the scientists or whoever looking through the monitor know that Peter is a monster, but most adults don't. It tells us grown-ups saw him as a beautiful young boy. Um, apparently, he has a very good image among the adults, which makes him even more dangerous. Right? If Peter tortures you and you go running to an adult, they may not believe you. What, you mean this handsome young kid was torturing you? Every aspect of the character designs of the design of the story world is creating a sense of uh, danger for Ender. Let's stop here. I remember before next week, please finish up to chapter six. If um, you get confused, or you're not sure what to pay attention to as you read, you can always go on Moodle and look at next week's discussion questions. You can use my questions to help guide your reading. I also encourage you to take notes while you read. Every few paragraphs, write down a note to help you remember what you have read. Because, you know, this book is it's not long, but it's not short either. Taking notes can help you remember, especially for the final exam, open book. You can either flip through the book or you can read your own notes, which is much shorter. OK, see you next week. <laughs>